Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Ephesians chapter 6. I have to say from the outset, kind of like a disclaimer, this message will need to be taken broadly in a sense of your context, um, what you do and how you do it. Um, I understand we have single mothers with children, we have um, retirees, we have stay-at-home mothers, we have homeschool mothers, we have mothers who are at home without children and it's just it's kind of like empty nesters and uh, maybe f- uh, families without children. So you'll have to take and apply this, Lord willing, and, and I will as well throughout the message, but in your context as it relates to you. By the way, that's what you ought to do every week. Um, I appreciate when people come out from service on Sunday and they say, they, says, they, they say, you know, that message indirectly um, wasn't maybe directly to me uh, the main point of the passage, but I've worked through that, thinking through how does it apply to me and my context. And I really appreciate that. Because a lot of times people will say, well, that message wasn't for me. That was for somebody else. <laughs> no, all of God's Word is profitable for all of us as God's children. So you have to work at it. Now, if you just sit there uh, like a days ago and just say, well, this isn't for me because I don't have a job today, you're going to miss the whole point of it. So you're going to have to do a little working uh, this morning. Uh, so I just want to put that disclaimer out there as we begin Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to read verses 5 through 9 because it's one sentence, but we're only probably going to deal with two verses uh, for this morning. Beginning verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants for Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man." knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. The numbers of hours spent by the average American in a lifetime is astounding. Have you ever just thought about how many hours of your life will be spent working? Now, some of you are saying right now already, I'm a stay-at-home mother. That includes your working. Some of you are saying, I'm a student, I'm a child, I'm in school. That's, That's part of your work as a child growing up. Some of you are farmers and you're saying, I don't average 40 hours a week. I average 175 a week sometimes it feels like at this time of the year. The average American works 40 hours a week. And they work four weeks. uh, uh, They work four weeks a month, which takes that average of two uh, of. uh, And I messed up my math. What is forty times forty? One hundred and sixty. I put two hundred down. It's just throwing me all off now. (laughs) Huh? Sixteen hundred. See, I'm way off. Let me just skip the, the intricacies. The average American will work over 90,000 hours in a 40-year lifespan. If you work from the age of 24, 25 to the age of 65, if you work longer than that, you're getting into the triple digits of how many hours that you put in of laboring and spending your time. Have you ever thought about how much time you spend away from your home working? throughout your lifetime, and the relationships that you have in your workplace, again, keep it in your context and your, and your immediate area. The majority of Christians' lives, the average Christian's life, is spent 
working. This is exactly what Paul is dealing with here in our text. But what I want to specify and kind of throw out there for us to get our mind churning a little bit is this aspect. We spend so much time in our labor and in our jobs as Christians, but so often we are disconnected within our workplace as it relates to spiritual things. In other words, we gather on Sunday morning, and I'm a Christian here, and I sing victory in Jesus, but tomorrow morning, how does that relate when I get on the job? How do I relate to my boss? How do I relate to my other co-workers? How do I relate with my children at home where I'm working? How do I relate with my spouse because we're both retired and we're at home? How does that affect me as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe there's a sad, and I put an emphasis last week, that something that we need to teach our children from the very early age is that we're not Christians only on Sunday. We are Christians when we go to school on Monday, when we go to to work on Monday. And we have done it as parents ourselves. We have separated the spiritual to the secular. In other words, I'm spiritual on Sunday, but then I go into the secular world and I'm secular. And that has defamed the name of Christ and the glory of His church. Brothers and sisters, when we come to know Christ, we are believers on Sunday and Monday and Thursday and even Saturday night. You just can't quit being saved. You can't just quit not being a Christian. And we have this mindset that we divide ourselves and so often it affects in our workplaces. When we come to our text this morning... I've got to do a little bit of work here to get our minds wrapped around what Paul is writing about. Because Paul is specifically, as you know, we've been building this progression from Ephesians 5 verse 18. He says, don't be drunk with wine, but be spirit filled. That's been his whole argument throughout the the rest of chapter 5 and even chapter 6. He reminds us not to be or to be spirit filled in the church As he says in in verse 21 of chapter 5, what does he say? He says, submit to one another out of fear of the Lord. He's talking prior to those verses about the church, how we're to submit ourselves, how we're to uh, uh, be in fellowship with one another. Then he moves from the church to the home. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Then he goes to Ephesians chapter 6, and he goes from the marital relationship to the children, the child's relationship. Obey your parents in the Lord. Now keep this in mind, then he transists, uh, and he's still going that same flow there, and he speaks to slaves. Now why would Paul include slaves? Because during Paul's day, if you were a slave, you was a part of that family. You were a part of that, that family who owned you. Now I want to stop there, and give some clarification because you're thinking of slavery of the 18 and 1900s, or the 1800s, 19th century. Slavery in Paul's day was radically different than it was in, our, in, in American history that we know it. How is it radically different? Because it didn't matter what color skin you were. You could be a white man and be a slave. Matter of fact, when Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians, matter of fact, there were slaves, Gentile slaves within the Ephesian church. These slaves also, some of them was highly educated. Some of them held city official positions. So they wasn't, and they had, they were very skillful. In other words, they wasn't uneducated and worthless people. But no, they were, they were, they were, very well, highly esteemed in a sense, although they were slaves. Not only that, but slaves were not only, because uh, it wasn't regardless of their, their ethnicity, uh, but also you could be a slave, but you wasn't a slave for a lifetime. You go back to the Old Testament, about every six or seven years, you could, people could buy you out of slavery. 
So that it, you wasn't bound to be a slave for the rest of your life. Like in American history, when you came over here and you ended up being a slave, it was more than likely you was going to be a slave for the rest of your life. There, there wasn't no grander thing to, to look for. And so there's a little bit difference there. And most Gentiles were slaves when Paul writes here. Can you imagine if you lived in Ephesus at this time, more than likely you and I would have been a slave? That you, would, you and I would have been a servant of a master who would bought us and buy us and perhaps trade us kind of like cattle? This is, the, this is what Paul is writing to. And as he talks about the church and he talks about the husband-wife relationship and the household codes, he deals with children. And then he even sticks slaves in there. Very important for us to think about this. But what were they to do? Well, he's been arguing from the very beginning that when we come to know Christ, we are a new creature. We've been changed. No one can say, I am of Christ, and their lives not be changed. Their hearts not be changed. The things that they once wanted to do, they no longer do. That's when the Spirit of God comes in and convicts and converts. A man is changed. That's what we call salvation. And so even as it was with these families, Paul is speaking to the slaves as well. He is reminding them that when you come to know Christ, not only to the slaves, but the churches in general, when you come to know Christ, your lives have been changed. You no longer reject or rebel against your master, but you submit to them, you obey to them. Now think about how radical it would be if you're sitting on the pew, Eli, and you have your whole line of slaves with you, and, and the pastor, the bishop, stands up and he reads this. Slaves obey your master. But Paul's got another word in Ephesians 5, 6, verse 10 when he talks about the master's responsibility. How uncomfortable would that be? What Paul is getting at is regardless of your position and your job or, or your, your uh, position as being a slave or a master, if you're a believer, there is no longer difference in Jew and Gentile. You are one in Christ. You are one in Christ. Therefore, the spirit-filled slave will obey his master. Now, let's stop right there and make a transition here. Because as far as I know, we don't have slaves and masters anymore, do we? Or do we? Well, in a sense we do. So we have to transition and make this transition to employees and employers. But it's kind of different. Because you are given your skills and your abilities, and your mindset to another person who repays you for your skills and your abilities and your uh, mindset and your abilities of the, of the mind. So there's a difference there as we think about it according to the Scripture. There is somewhat of a difference, but however, as Paul makes this this commandment or this exhortation here for slaves, keep in mind that for our day he is speaking to employee-employer's relationship. And what Paul is arguing for is how to be a spirit-filled servant or a spirit-filled slave, if you will. Now this word here, slave, you can, John MacArthur wrote a whole book on it. I'm not here to try to defend it or anything else, but I'm going to take a little bit different view of Dr. MacArthur on this, and I'm going to say that this word slave, which in the original Greek means bond servant, or servant, your translation may say, or bond servant, to mean exactly what it means, it says, a servant. When I think of being a believer in Christ, I believe that we are no longer of ourselves, but we are a servant of Christ. And brothers and sisters, when you go to work tomorrow or mother, when you stay at home or retiree, whatever you do, you are being a servant ultimately to Christ. And what Paul is arguing for is for the slaves or the servant to be spirit-filled. And so this morning I want to give you four marks of a spirit-filled slave or a spirit-filled servant as it relates to our workplace. 
Now, I think one of the largest outside of the home, one of the greatest places that we can lose our testimony is in the workplace. Wouldn't you agree? How many of you ever blew it at work? Okay, don't raise your, uh, okay, y'all raise your hand. But, but we do that, don't we? I mean, it's just real life. We have flesh. How many of us blow it at home? We blow it at home. So you spend a lot of time at home, and you spend a lot of time at work. And so often, it's the easiest place. Matter of fact, just wherever you spend a lot of time at is where you're going to blow it at. <laughs> and for most Americans, we spend a lot of time at work. But for us at Pleasant Hill this morning, I want us to think, wherever we're at, whatever our job persists of or, or consists of, I want us to think of how can we be spirit-filled believers at our workplace. Whether it be at home, whether it be at job, whether it be at school, whether it just be interacting, wherever we are in our life, our circle of influence, how can we be spirit-filled? The first mark I want us to think about is that the spirit-filled servant will have a heart of obedience. This is the very first mark of a, of a spirit-filled servant or a spirit-filled slave. He'll want to obey. Notice what our text says in verse 5. Paul says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters. This word obey means a readiness to hear. It's the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 6 and verse 1 when he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Children ought to have a readiness to hear what their parents have to say. Paul uses this word obey to mean to, to quickly conform to a command. He is reminding these slaves that when your master tells you to do something, you are to quickly fall into submission of that command. 2014, as it relates to masters and servants, employers and employees, as employees, we have a, being spirit-filled, we have an obligation to come underneath the command of our bosses or our employees or our immediate supervisor. Think about it. There is nothing worse to defame the name of Christ than for a professing believer in Christ when he is told to do something by his boss to say, no, I ain't going to do it. For all the other co-workers to see. Or when the boss tells them to, to do this or not to do that, that they go right ahead and do it and make it a big laughing stock game with the, with the company and the boys around the water cooler. But yet, we profess that we are believers. As spirit-filled believers, a mark of a Christian and a mark of a believer and, and it should be of obedience. When our boss tells us to do something, that's just what we do. After Samantha and I were married and we had our children and uh, I went on the road driving a truck for a while. And boy, that's tough for you truck drivers and people that works away from home through the week and stuff like that. I decided I wanted to come off the road, and so I, I ended up coming off the road, and I went to work at a chicken factory where they brought in live chicken, and they processed chicken. You ever eat Pilgrim's Pride chicken or Gold Kiss chicken? I worked there, one of the plants in Alabama. And I worked from 6 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning, Monday through Friday, and then on Friday nights I would go in at 2 o'clock to work maintenance from 2 o'clock to 2 o'clock just for extra money because we didn't make any money, but you could work all the hours you wanted to. And I worked my way up to the position of lead man in what they called the live hang area. Would you ever guess what it means to be a lead man in a place called live hang? What do you think live hang is? Live chickens. They brought the chickens in, usually about 150,000 a night, and we had the responsibility of hanging them by their feet. And these chickens, after they shot with hormones and steroids and everything else, they grow them in six weeks and they grow to be eight to ten pounds. And as a lead person, though, I also had the responsibility of outside in backing up the trucks and all that stuff. So I was, wasn't inside in the live hang area often. I was outside. But there was those occasions that my boss would come to me and say, Chad, tonight you have to work live hang. I'm a Christian. We're in church. Love the Lord. And you know what I would say? I ain't going to do it. I'm not going in there. First of all, it's really dark. 
And they have these UV lights. And you have to wear these aprons from your feet down, rubber boots, and you've got to wear glasses and hair nets. All, the whole part of your body is covered and mask. And every three seconds, you have to get an eight to 10 pound chicken and hang it on the hook for eight to 10 hours a night. Let me tell you, you're talking about hurting after doing that. And plus, I was working with other people who was not my nationality and didn't even speak my language. And plus, if you was brave enough not to wear a mask, sometimes those chickens can relieve themselves as they're hanging them. And think about it being this time of the year in a little room hanging chickens. And my heart, as my supervisor would come out there, because I'd act like he's never, I'd see him coming. I knew somebody's late out of work. And because I'm making a quarter more an hour, I'm fixing to go on live. And I'd like to start walking off to the other part of the campus there. I just, and he'd come finally get me. He said, Chad, you need to go live hang. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, you're going to do it. You're a lead man, you're going to do it. Do you see my heart there? Do you see my heart, my disrespect, and my rebellion? Because when I took the job, I knew that was part of the job. I, I didn't want it as much as I had it. I just wanted the quarter an hour raise. But my heart was rebellion against my supervisor, against my superior, against my earthly master. What do you suppose, or how do you suppose that I would be able to witness? Because I didn't do this rebellion just in and of myself, but there was other co-workers around when they'd seen me rebel against my supervisor. And how do you suppose I would do in sharing the gospel with them and how Christ has changed my life? Would there be much effect on that? A heart of obedience that Paul is speaking about for, earthly, for the earthly ma masters, our employees, when they tell us to have that heart of obedience. When our employee, uh, employer tells us, uh, you know, work starts at 8. What type of heart does it show when we show up at 8.15? Or 8.30? Wouldn't it be the great, the good heart of a, a, of a spirit-filled believer to show up like 15 minutes till? And to be eager and willing and ready to, to take on the day? If our employee pays us eight hours a day, shouldn't we do eight hours of work? Having that heart of obedience? I just thought about, you know, just thinking through some of my experience in my jobs and some of the things I have, I've done in the past and some of the relationships and some of the facts, I just wonder how I affected the name of Christ and the gospel going forth in my actions and attitudes. And this doesn't have to be, like I said, just at, at the workplace. This can be at home as well or wherever we're serving. By the way, it can even happen within the church having the wrong attitude and the wrong heart about obedience. Paul says the first mark of a spirit-filled servant is a heart of obedience. He says, obey your earthly masters. Notice the second thing. Another mark of being spirit-filled servant will be an attitude of respect. I think this kind of goes hand in hand, but there's a sense here where Paul says that we're to obey our earthly masters. How? With arrogance and pride? No. Notice what the text says. What, what does the Bible say? You got your Bibles open? With fear and trembling. The, that fear and trembling has, a, has the understanding of respect, of reverence. This word fear literally means revere. Or trembling means to quake. In other words, it means to be sober about what you are doing, being careful, being conscientious about why you're doing what you're doing and for who you're doing it for. And Paul says being a spirit-filled servant or slave is having this attitude of respect. One person says what you revere and respect, you will be careful what you do for them. What you fear and what you revere, you'll be very careful for how you work and how you labor for those individuals. That's the reason why he goes on to say later, don't do it just for the pleasing of man, but do it unto the Lord as we're making our way there. Be careful what you do. Be conscientious of what you do. 
These slaves were to conduct themselves, not in just any way, but they were to have respect for their masters. If any of you are business owners or any of you are bosses or supervisors or ever been in that position, you know and you have dealt with rebellious employees. Those who just don't want to to do what you tell them to do as their boss and as their employee. For us as believers, being spirit-filled, we have this attitude of respect. We are humble when our boss tells us what to do. When our employer tells us to do this or do that, we ought to respond in a, with an attitude of respect. It's okay to tell our, our bosses, yes ma'am, or yes sir, no sir, yes sir. There's nothing wrong with that. Just having respect. How often do you hear of coworkers belittling the company or downtrodden the bosses? When I worked for Books A Million, it was one of the best truck driving jobs in the state of Alabama outside of Walmart. Made very good money, had great benefits. But in about 2007, when things started to go downward and the internet really started to boom and people started buying books on Kindles and iPads rather than on the bookstores, the economy began going downward for the book company. And they began putting more on us, driving more miles and less pay and taking away from our benefits and taking away from our bonuses. And guess what that caused a group of truck drivers to do? Become disrespectful. And let me tell you, truck drivers can be disrespectful real quickly if they're unconverted, especially, or even if they're converted. And I remember our boss in one of the meetings, he had no power over this situation. He has bosses above him. I remember these big grizzly men getting up, raising their voices, pointing their finger at at this gentleman who had no control over the situation, just so disrespectful. No attitude of respect. What does that show? What does that prove of our hearts when you and I are disrespectful to our superiors or to our supervisors? It shows our hearts, doesn't it? Do you try to think the best about your employers? Do you try to think the best about your situation and your workplace, wherever it may be? And listen, I'm going to get to the end of this and, and it's going to affect everybody, okay? So bear with me because I know some of you are, are, don't work. But how does this, how do, how do we respect and honor our employers? Do, do we, by God's grace, try the best as an employee to be the best, to be the best employee to our employer? Paul says to have the right attitude of respect. Thirdly, he says, the third mark of a spirit-filled servant or slave will be the spirit of commitment. Notice he says, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart. This phrase, sincere heart, means an undivided heart. It's a commitment. It's a spirit of commitment. It's a heart that is not mixed by your thoughts or feelings. It has to do with a spirit of commitment, not wavering. Matter of fact, for the believer, we should not be tossed to and fro, as Paul says. But there should be a, a stable commitment, an anchor that is held down that we God has placed us in our workplace. He has blessed us with a job to earn and, and to provide for our family. This is where God has placed us for the season. And I'm wholeheartedly committed until God moves me elsewhere perhaps. But this is where I am. This is where I'm going to serve. And I'm going to do it with a wholehearted, sincere heart. I'm not going to do it half-heartedly. Have you, ever, have you guys ever worked and just done something half-heartedly? I'm the only one, right? Just, you know, some day you just don't feel like giving 110%. No. Paul says with this undivided heart, we, we are thankful unto the Lord for what we have, this job, and we're going to serve wholeheartedly. 
This word sincere means liberal and bountiful. What it means is I'm not going to just do 50% today. I, I wonder, farmers, what if you just went out and harvested 50% of your corn? That's probably what's going to harvest anyways, right? Or 50% of our tobacco. And we just leave the rest out in the field because we got enough. We got enough to get by this year. That's okay to leave. That's not going to work, is it? What if the attitude for the believer is just to, just to do enough to skim by? You remember those days in high school? I'm just going to do enough to get by. What kind of attitude and heart? Paul says with a sincere heart, a liberal heart, a bountiful heart. In other words, the Christian, the spirit-filled servant should do above and beyond even more that's expected. Now, I know in our culture that is radical. And we get that from the Greeks, from the Gentiles. Why is that? Because the Greeks and the, Gen uh, the Gentiles of the day, they looked at labor and working. They looked down their nose at people who had to labor and work. They seen that as demeaning. They seen that as belittling. And let me tell you, we live in a society today that even looks at work today as belittling and demeaning. There is absolutely, I'm going to chase a rabbit here. There is absolutely nothing wrong with working. There is nothing wrong with a hard day's work. I'm so thankful as your pastor that I can stand up here and say that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a man or a woman putting in a hard day work. And we live in a society today that is kind of getting that away that everybody deserves this, mentality, this deserving mentality. And a lot of people think too that the reason why we have to work is because of sin. Uh-uh. No. God gave Adam work to do before the fall. He says, keep my garden. He gave him labor. He gave him work. And it was a joy. And it was a blessing. And it was just perfect. Now, because of sin, it has affected our labor. Remember what he says in Genesis 3? Man shall what? Earn a living by the sweat of his brow. Women, the reason why you have child pain or labor birth pains is because of fall. Men, the reason why you have thistles growing in your corn and your soybeans and you have to hoe your tobacco is because of the fall. But God gave us work and it's good. We need to teach our children that. And we need to be reminded of that. And it's not demeaning or belittling either for women who stay at home or even those women who work outside the home. It is a blessing to work. And we ought to do it liberally, bountifully. It's even okay for preachers to work, isn't it? Because preachers don't do anything. I want to read a quote from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's been dead for a few years now, but I thought it was just thinking about the spirit of commitment in our duty, in our work. Listen to what he says. The Christian should always be the best in every department. I am not suggesting that the Christian is always the most able man of his group. He may not be. There may be others who are not Christians who are much abler but the Christian should be all out, always industrious, always honest, always truthful, always reliable, always helpful, always trustworthy. That is what should always stand out in the Christian. You cannot give him new ability or new propensities, but a Christian, however unintelligent he may be, can be an honest man. He can be an upright man. He can be a reliable man, a man who keeps good time, a trustworthy man, a truthful man, a man whose word is his bond always, a man upon whom you can rely. And all this because he is a Christian. There used to be a thought that went like this, that if he is a Christian, he is 100% committed. That's not the day we live in anymore. Except in areas that we want to be committed in. Let's just forget about the job now. Let's talk about the church. How does this relate to the church? How many of us are 100% committed? 
committed to Christ and His church. We need that spirit of commitment. We live in a time and day, I've been writing papers after paper after paper about this issue in our, in our, in our world today about commitment. People don't want to make any commitments anymore. So much so, so much so that people, are, more people, they are saying now that marriage will be a thing of the past in the next 10 to 15 years because everybody's just going to live together. Used to people lived together the last 20 years, they would live together have a, you know, and then end up getting married. Now they, they said they're not even going to bother with getting married. They're just going to cohabitate together. It's called cohabitation. This is a popular trend. This is a popular movement. You know why? Because there's no commitment. I can pack my stuff up and I can leave whenever I want to and you can't do anything about it. There's no commitment. How does that reflect on the gospel and the church? And brothers and sisters, as believers here today, we need to have this spirit of commitment. Whatever we're doing, do it. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5.8, whatever our hand finds to do it, do it with all thy might. My grandpa used to say something like this, if you have time not to do it right the first time, you, you, you sure won't have time to do it the second time right. I think it's kind of what he... In other words, why not do it 100%, you know? Why not do what you're going to do and do it 100% or not do it at all? And that's the world we live in. And even as it relates to us working, and, and we do it with all our might. Now, I understand you're sitting in the pews. You say, Brother Chad, you're preaching, and you don't understand my boss. You don't understand my situation. Yes, I do. I really do. I've been there, and I struggle with it even as a pastor. To have the spirit of commitment, to, to give 110%. We should, work, we should set the standard tomorrow at work. People ought to look to us and say, what in the world? Why is he? Boy, he is just really after it. She is really just going above and beyond. Until the Lord moves. The last thing here, the spirit of commitment. The last thing he reminds us here, and I hope this gets all of us, the fourth mark of a spirit-filled servant is that there will be a pursuit of God in our work. Did you know that you don't work for your boss? Well, in a sense you do. Some of you as, as independent and uh, owners of your own business, you, you don't have a boss if you're a business owner, in a sense. Notice what he says here in this last phrase of verse 5. With a sincere heart, you would obey your masters with fear and trembling, an undefeated, uh, with respect, an undivided heart, a sincere heart, as you would Christ. And notice what he goes on to say in verse 6. Not by the way of eye service or as people service, people pleasers, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. It's the pursuit of God in our labor that brings glory and gives us a sense of purpose in our work. Let me tell you, if you go to work tomorrow because you work for Jane or Bob there's going to be a sense of discouragement. And there's not going to be much pep in your step because Jane or Bob eventually is going to take you for granted. It's going to take you, uh, uh, take this, you know, cause, uh, uh, treat you unfairly or not appreciate what you do. But when you do your work as unto the Lord, God has just for a season placed Bob or Jane over you. You are ultimately, as a spirit-filled believer, you are working for the Lord. You serve Christ. You are not a servant or a slave to Jane and Bob as a sense. You are a slave and a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ as a believer. Your work is for God. You submit to God. And by submitting to your supervisor or your boss, you are in, 
submitting to God's authority over you. Have you, have you ever been just discouraged at work because you've been taken advantage of? People didn't appreciate you and what you did. It's because our mindset has been shifted off as believers of who we are working for and, and to. I often hear this and you hear it too. Oh, you're a pastor, so you're in full-time ministry. Well, even when I was bivocational, which means I pastored a church, I went to seminary, and I worked a 40 to 50 hour a week job. I was a full time pastor then. I was in full time ministry then. I would say for you, if you are a farmer, you're in full time ministry. I would say to you, if you're a school teacher or you work in a factory or whatever you do, if you're a stay at home mother, if you're just a, a, a wife keeping the home, you are a full time ministry. Do you see how we disconnect? We only look at ministry. Oh, the preacher preaches, so he's in a ministry. You're in the ministry if you're a believer in Christ. God has given you a place in a mission field to work. Did you know that your mission field is where you will go to work tomorrow to make an influence on somebody's life for Christ? You skilled teachers might not be able to, to specifically say those words, but you can pour your life in those children. And I sent you guys an email to read about that and how you can affect those children's lives for the glory of God. And you mothers at home having an effect in the mission field at home and you men working in the fields and going to the restaurant for lunch at Tisha's up in Cross Plains or whatever you do, you can have an effect on people's lives for the glory of God as you pursue God and where He has placed you. But see, our mindset is, I'm only a Christian on Sunday, and tomorrow it's all business, secular work. Now, I'm not talking about opening your Bible and preaching a sermon to them. I'm just talking about that, that person who is at work, whose mother just found out that she has some type of problem, health problem. And you're just being a friend and a Christian to listen to what they had to say for 10 minutes at break. It's those practical ways that we begin to pursue God. We see that we do it for the, doing the will of God from our heart. We work as unto Christ. You are as much in full-time ministry as I am. The only difference is the church supports me. Whereas your job supports you. This is the full-time ministry. This is our pursuit of God. So let me ask you, out of all the hours that you and I spend at work, how do we do in relating our lives as believers into the workplace? How do we relate our lives when we go to the doctors or to the, to the grocery store? I don't care if, if you're a police officer, a farmer, a nurse, a school teacher, or if you flip burgers at McDonald's. See, our society looks down at that. And, and they devalue things like that. If you're a spirit-filled believer and you're doing it for the glory of God, praise His name. How do we relate our lives at work? Are we spirit-filled servants? And are we working as unto the Lord? Because ultimately, as believers, we're slaves to Christ. You look throughout Paul's writing, he refers to himself over and over and over again that he is not of his own, that he is a servant and a slave of Christ. Can we say that? Can you say that here today? Listen, I don't expect you tomorrow at 5 o'clock when that alarm goes off to jump out of bed and click your heels. And, but there ought to be something inside of you that praises God and thanks Him. He has saved you. He has blessed you. 
with the ability to do what you do to provide for your family the job that He has blessed you with for the season that you're in. You say, well, Brother Chad, I don't wake up till 9, I'm retired. (laughs) Sit on the front porch and drink coffee till 11. Let me encourage you, give yourself, pour your life out into the church. Give yourself 110% to the bride of Christ. God has blessed you with retirement. He's blessed you with the ability. Matter of fact, there's no such thing as retirement as a Christian. You keep working until Jesus comes. Keep serving, keep studying, keep calling, keep sending cards out. You ladies and men, you do these things. Just keep being a blessing. Keep working. That's the job the Lord has given to you. Just keep doing it. And if you're here today without Christ... You're like, I hate my job. I hate my life. There's nothing good. There's just, you have a bad outlook on life. Probably because you've not experienced the grace of God in salvation. I'm not saying that we all just click our heels and so happy to go to work every day. I talked to a farmer this past week. And uh, we, uh, I was running and he was driving and I pulled, you know, he stopped and we just sat and talked for a little while. He says, you know what? He says, I I just, I really thank the Lord that I enjoy doing what I get to do. I thought, wow, you don't hear that much. Most people hate their jobs, hate their bosses, they hate their coworkers. I mean, not literally hate, but dislike. And I told him, I said, you know, brother, That's a rare statement that you just said. But he reminded me, really the big scheme of things, as we got on in our conversation, he says, I get to enjoy God every day in His creation and what I do. Wow. And regardless of where you serve or where you work, you can enjoy God and you can pursue God for the glory of God as you are a spirit-filled Believer and a spirit-filled servant for Him. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Help us, Lord. We all struggle. We know that we live in a fallen world. We know that our jobs are demanding and taxing. Regardless if we work outside the home or in the home, whether we're business owners, whether we're independent farmers or whether we're teachers or police Lord, we just know that because of the fall, our work is laborious. But Lord, if we see you in our work, it becomes joyful. And Lord, thank you that for Christians as believers, we are servants of yours and that you have placed your spirit in us to serve you. Lord, not as a burden, but as a joy. Help us, Lord, to affect those co-workers around us. Help us to have this joy that you have set in our hearts with the gospel. Help us to be evangelistic with the word. Help us to be committed in our workplaces, but also in our homes and in the church. This affects every area of our lives. God, give us grace. And for that person here this morning without Christ... Lord, they have no clue about being a slave or a servant because they're out on their own doing what they want. Oh, Lord, would you break them? Would you point them to show them the gospel through Christ and how he, in some ways, acted as a slave, being obedient and being submissive to your will, that you nailed him to the cross, that he was buried and rose again the third day to justify sinners of their sins forever. Holy Spirit, work now in Christ's name. Amen.